Hey, hello and welcome back everybody. This is episode 110 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. 110. That's the first barbell set I ever, uh, ever owned. It was 110 pounds. So this is going to be a great one. Hey, while I have your attention, uh, we came out with a new course this week. Yes, it's about easy strength, but it's advanced techniques. Uh, the price is really reasonable. For the members, it's 50 bucks. And again, I apologize for having to charge, but you know, there's a lot of work that goes into it and we have to pay people for editing and all kinds of things. Uh, if you're not a member of the site, it's 100, but uh, why don't you just join the site, uh, for, you know, and we have codes all over you can join it with uh, and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, it's 18 different units, so it's 18 videos. There's lots and lots of videos. There's lots of uh, written content. I'm really pleased with it. Um, people keep asking, you know, do I need to keep talking about easy strength? And I'm like, well, no, I don't. I don't, but other people don't seem to understand it. So I have to keep coming up with, with new ways of explaining it. Now, that's part one. Part two is that what happens when you start doing the easy strength programs, the easy strength protocols, is that you start to pick up these other things about weightlifting and, and sports performance and, and life. And one of the problems with doing easy strength is that uh, a lot of other things you're you're striving to do also become easier because your workouts are shorter, tighter, focused. Uh, you have a much longer approach to things. It takes me right back to what Coach Mon told me in 19, fall of 1977, you know, little and often over the long haul. The easy strength protocols are long haul protocols. And uh, boy, there's some stuff in there I wish I'd have known early in my career, obviously. Um, we have a section on loaded carries, and I've said before that Olympic lifting, loaded carries, and easy strength are the three biggest game changers in my career. And I and I and I can't bang the drum hard enough on those three things. Um, sign up at danjohnuniversity.com. Enjoy and make sure, as I always ask, give me some feedback if you came up with any ideas or any solutions for any problems that came along. Um, like I always tell any idiot, can find problems. Uh, I look for people who can find solutions. Uh, I like to think of myself in my career as someone who finds solutions. I had a nice talk with one of my mentors uh, yesterday as I'm, as I'm doing this podcast. Uh, we, we bumped into each other at the Greek festival and we sat down and it's funny because my whole family is pulling me. We got to go. We're late for this other thing. And I'm just sitting there. And, and one of the things he said uh, to me, and it means still means a lot, is that I was always a person who sought solutions. And that's, I can't think of higher praise. So as you go through the problem, as you go through the program and you find a problem, seek solutions and let give back to me and see if we can make everything better. Thank you, and, and I hope you enjoy the course. And let's go through this week's questions on the podcast. Question number one comes from Deacon. And Deacon says, how would you recommend building strength for Olympic lifting other than just doing the Olympic lifts? You know, first off, Deacon, um, you, you, you've just joined into a big, uh, pillow fight, uh, among Olympic lifters. There are many Olympic lifters who believe you can only build strength through the Olympic lifts. And then there's other people, not usually Olympic lifters who think that you can do with all kinds of things like, uh, bands and chains and, uh, assistant exercises. Uh, I, I, I take a very powerful stance right down the middle. I think both sides are right. Um, so yeah, I, I think the classic best ways to build up strength in the Olympic lifts, just to answer this first question first, is front squats. I think front squats just about the answer to everything. And the other second exercise, and by the way, there should be no surprise, these are Dick Notmeyer's answers. He was my coach. Still not, he's 90 years old. Uh, I called him the other day. Uh, I, when I was on the road, he, I had my birthday, and of course he always calls my birthday. And so we talked for a long time again. And uh, he, he believed that the front squat and the snatch grip deadlift were the two best exercises for building strength for Olympic lifting. Uh, oddly, the snatch grip uh, deadlift came back into my career uh, after the advice of Pavel because he believes it's an armor building exercise along with like those, you know, double kettlebell cleans. Yeah, so yeah, I think I think those two by themselves would be a good start. Uh, I would also say, and this maybe comes from my, my youth, but the, the military press, or whatever we're calling it today, uh, still is great value uh, uh, just to build that base overhead strength. 
Uh, I know it's different when you do the push jerk and you do the, the jerk and, and the snatch. But uh, once you start doing a lot of uh, ver uh, overhead vertical presses, uh, military presses, <clears throat> you really get a sense of how important the serratus muscles are in pulling everything underneath. So let's go to your second question. I'm in my early 30s. Well, lucky you. And recently out of the military, and I'm trying to rebuild a solid foundation for strength for the rest of my life. Good. I'll be glad you did. How would you organize a long-time training program? Alternate easy strength with the workout generators, or would you recommend something else? Deacon, you just you just said it. exactly. That's exactly what I recommend. Uh, I got a couple of courses on the site, um, and you don't even need to go to my, be a member. I mean, uh, you can look up my look. Uh, I mean, if you could do Dave Turner's beginner's program three days a week, uh, I don't know if you can do it more than eight weeks, but that it's eight sets of two in the snatch, eight sets of one, eight singles in the clean and jerk. Um, we later lowered it down to five sets of two in the front squat and five sets of three in the military press. And he also expected you to warm up before you did that. Okay. All that's happened in one hour. I mean, getting eight doubles, uh, by itself in, in the snatch, uh, it's it's exhausting and, and of course you just stay with the single weight on this program uh you could certainly look up my name and pacifica barbell club and look at our old training program or you can just go to the work i just go to the site and pull off my like easy strength for olympic lifting and i, I have a new one coming up pretty soon called three by three by three you know something like that you can do a long long time and after that six eight twelve weeks depending on whatever olympic lifting program you settle on it doesn't have to be mine it can be anybody's yeah, I like the idea of just plug in the workout generator for, you know, maybe six, eight, 12 weeks, you know, ma match them up, you know, eight weeks on, eight weeks off. Or if you're competing, you know, eight weeks, body build until you're eight weeks out, body build until you're eight weeks out, you know, that kind of thing, and just keep bouncing it back and forth. It, I'll just tell you this, you know, as, as you might know, and I've beat this to death, I'm 64, and I'm making some of the best... Well, I don't know. I got to be careful about what I say here. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of famous for for uh, my hyperbole. I think I've said that a million times. That was a joke. Um, but uh, I would love to see. I, I would. I, I'm surprised how much progress I've made in just combining easy strength for Olympic lifting for fat loss, to, which is basically O lifting followed by walking three days a week, and then. Uh, Mobility, flexibility, followed by walking two days a week and then just take two easy bike rides or strolls two other days a week. So, yeah, I think it's that simple. Um, at your age, you still can get away with just about anything, but you really want to start thinking about basic hypertrophy, basic joint mobility, and keeping your fast twitch muscles around. So the combination you discuss here is spot on. And honestly, if you can pull it off, I, I don't know if you can get better advice. Good question. Thank you. We have a question from Katie. Katie, Katie, Katie. I developed a ganglion on my wrist from Olympic lifting. Uh, my brother Phil used to get those. And they were called Bible cysts because if you whacked them with the Bible, they went away. And it's interesting because I got one later in my life and the doctor said, well, let's just try this. And he, uh, I think he just basically shot it with something. I don't remember what we shot it with, but uh, it just took care of business and it was gone. Um, I don't even know which wrist it was in. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you to bang it with something, but uh, it sure helped. It went away when I stopped training. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Boy, I would I would make sure you see a doctor about that. That, Yeah, but I would like to get back to the Olympic lifts. Do you have any recommendations on how to train to avoid developing this again? If it's better that I don't do Olympic lifting, what other programs would you recommend? Let's not answer the second part. Let's just answer doing Olympic lifting. Um, the thing I would like to know, uh, Katie, does it hurt doing the snatch? Because if it doesn't hurt snatching, and it because the clean seems to be the issue with some people and their wrist problems, but the snatch never seems to be an issue. Now, as a person of uh, a really badly broken wrist and two wrist surgeries, I really once I could grab, I, I could make, I could grab the bar. I was okay almost instantly. Well, instantly, you know, in six months, <laughs> overnight results in six months. Um, the snatch might be really good. Uh, I would be interested if you just did the squat snatch, overhead squats, 
first. Try the, just try those out first. Uh, do high pulls if you know how with straps, you know, protect those wrists. Do that for a little bit. Get a sense on how that wrist is coming around. And then I would think of answering, uh, adding the front squat next. And if you can handle the load here without getting anything growth there, uh, maybe it's just as simple as it's the, it's the clean. And honestly, um, I got, I've got some friends online who believe that the two most important exercises in the Olympic lifts are the front squat and the squat snatch. Um, you know, you could put together a pretty good program for most of the time, uh, with just those two lifts. Uh, I have one friend who does those twice a day, snatches and front squats twice a day. Uh, Nick Horton, very impressive. Um, and just see how that goes. And if you want to compete, you know, just kind of go into a meet and, and you know, without doing a lot of clean and jerks and, and see how it goes. I don't need to clean and jerk before a meet. Um, <laughs> at my last meet, you could kind of tell, actually, actually, I'm wrong. I actually do need them. But uh, see how that goes. Because I think, I think the snatch, I think the squat snatch, I think the overhead press and the front squat, I think that's the money exercises for, you know, lifelong fitness. So... That's a strong statement, but I think I'm right. Okay, thank you. Um, please, uh, you have to get back to me on that, okay? Thank you. Peter asked a question. My family and I just relocated, closing our gym, gym in Spokane for a new job for my wife and to be closer to her family. While I figure things out and settle in, I picked up a couple of classes at my local, local private high school teaching anatomy and physiology class and a PE class. Initially, I was thinking anatomy and physiology would be the most difficult class, but I'm having a much more difficult time figuring out physical education. I know. You get no support. Uh, no one in the faculty is going to respect you. I, I know that because uh, I've been there. And they'll say derogatory things about what you do. But I'll just say this. Uh, I, this is not to put down any of my other school teachers, but I always put Mr. Bob Jacobs, my biology uh, teacher in high school, on a pedestal academically. He taught me how to teach. He taught me how to get people interested in things. He was a fabulous teacher. But stepping back, the best two teachers I had were my high school, uh, my junior high physical education course, uh, uh, Mr. Dave Freeman and Mr. Giro, and I don't know what, Mr. Robert Giro, maybe. Um, they had a, a very disciplined approach to physical education. Um, we started off the year by marching because they thought marching was an important skill to learn. Uh, for every single section we had, be it wrestling or volleyball, basketball, uh, all the American sports, track and field. And we had to do all the track and field events is where I learned the discus. Thank you. That changed my life. Um, but besides doing the skills, we also had to take a test. And we had a tournament in every in every single discipline, so I learned a lot. Uh, they we had an academic test on everything. You had to know the rules of the game. You had to have a, a skills test, and then we had a tournament. We got points, and then to get an A, you had to do well on the academic. You had to do well on the skills, and you had to do well in the tournament. And if the tournament your team in the tournament was terrible, it didn't really hurt you that much if you stepped up in the other two. Um, here I am, 64, and I'm still talking about those two. I have no idea if they're still with us, uh, none at all. But if they are, I, well, and if they're not with us, uh, I give them a silent thank you because they changed my life. Let's get back to your question. The problem is we don't have access to the weight room as there is another class in there at the same time. Well, that sure didn't hurt anybody at the schools I've taught at. I'd be given a full lecture in the weight room on safety and some, and the junior high coach would come in and let us, Animals just roll around. Yes, yes. And the students, the, his delightful students. Animals. Um, I want to make sure the kids have fun. You know how I spell fun? W-I-N. Learn something new about fitness and challenge them physically. Do you have any recommendations on how teaching a PE class without equipment or know of any resources I can look up into for ideas? Well, yeah. I mean, first off, I mean, Ulra's book on, um, it's right there. It's a German book from 1961 on circuit training. I still think it's the best way to teach group classes. I, I love circuit training. Now you're going to say, I can't do circuits. Yeah, you can. I would do, what I would do is look up the word par course. 
P-A-R course, C-O-U-R-S-E, par course. Um, of course, I was, <laughs> of course, of course, of course I was there when the course started. I was lucky in junior college because Skyline College was one of the first places to get a par course, and they hired Caden's Keys Tons in to run the program of Lifetime Fitness. So we had a lot of people in the community. The joy of being at Skyline in the 70s is that the bulk of my classmates were, and the courses I was in were women in transition, and they were also taking PE classes uh, for their health, their health and fitness. And so I'd be in a class like uh, paralegal research or something like that, and I'd look around and I'd be the only person under 40 or 50 in the class. And uh, we were all struggling together, and boy, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Uh, so the idea of a par course is you, you have a station, um, push-ups, and then you all hop up and walk, run, sprint to the next station where there's sit-ups. We all hop up, walk, run. And then what you could do is just walk around the school and just set up stations. Now, you might have to be with the athletes, um, and you could set it up you know, either as big or as small as you'd like to. You know, if you had medicine balls, you could, you know, they could play games with it. Uh, by the way, uh, if you have two-pound Dynamax medicine balls, um, you can play games like Hoover Ball, which is volleyball with, uh, look up the word Hoover Ball, which is volleyball with a medicine ball. You, we play Ultimate with it, which is Ultimate Frisbee, but with a two-pound Dynamax ball. Uh, you can just have a lot of fun, a lot of fun, uh, as my students at St. Mary's learned recently. When I had, when I got a chance to teach them, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100. Uh, percent Look up parkour, look up circuit training, and, uh, and don't forget, every single day there has to be a moment where you talk about, um, you know, don't eat crap. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to turn the corner on uh, obesity in the United States, but we're, we're not doing well. Uh, and uh, when you look at, when you go into the lunchroom and see what's being offered, uh, when you go to a, a, a seven-year-old soccer game and you, they all get treats at the end. And I'm talking about, they get the, those, those drinks, you know, those massive calorie loaded sports drinks, which is just pure crap. Um, and then they have, you know, either, I mean, God, if, if they ate donuts, it would be a step up nutritionally. I mean, Peter, I'm here for you. Thank you for sharing the question. Look up those resources. Uh, maybe you and I need to have a phone call sometime. And, but just know uh, I'm out. Uh, I'm, I'm cheering you on all the way. Uh, you know, so I, I feel like I'm cheering on the Spartans, uh, you know, uh, you know, at the gates of hell, you know, 300, you know. Or, you know. Yay! Yay! <laughs> uh, the, the odds are overwhelming, but keep fighting, you know. So good luck to you, Peter. And I'm sorry I can't give you more information. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. We have a question from Steph. What would you recommend to help sort right and left side imbalances for kettlebell front squats? I have only single bells of 18, 24, and 32. My left side is evidently not as strong as my right side, especially in the front rack position. Well, you know, Steph, uh, and I'm guessing you're female, one thing I'd like you to, to do is I want to make sure, I'd like you to see a, a medical doctor on this. There is a condition in women where the left side is clearly weaker than the right side. Um, I don't I don't want to get too personal, but this, uh, this the flags came up when you asked this question. Um, and I don't want to be rude, but if there is a clear cup size differential between, um, well, the area you would measure cups, uh, and the left side being clearly smaller. And if you've always been a little bit overwhelming, not a little bit, but overwhelmingly right side dominant, there is a condition you might want to look at. It's not serious, but it is something I'd like you to at least get cleared for before we move on, if any of those things ring a bell. Other than that, um, you know, there's, there's the, the old Arnold Schwarzenegger technique where you would take one day a week and focus only on, um, the side that's it giving you issues, uh, this is my left side, so you would practice on that, practice on that side a little bit more. Um, most of us have imbalances. Of course, I have imbalances from being a discus thrower and from being right-handed in a throwing world in, a, in North America. The sports I played were all throwing sports. <laughs> so I have imbalances, but 
uh, your own life story might, you might say, oh, that makes sense because I did blank and in blank it's right side dominant. So the Arnold technique is good. Um, th there are some other ideas, you know, uh, it might be a stretch for you to do double kettlebell front squats um, where you play around with different unbalanced loads. So 18 and 24 and then the next time 24 and 18 and just play around to see if it's a if it's a whole body issue not just a left side issue and if it's a whole body issue then um, start doing your suitcase carries and your uh, bear hug carries and see if you can straighten that out uh, Steph I get this question a lot but I don't get this question a lot from females so if you don't mind me doing that uh, you're if doing that favor and having that looked at for me okay and there's nothing wrong with going to see a doctor uh, anyway, so thank you. Well, we have a question from Steve. I wonder what your thoughts are on setting goals which are specific enough to be personally motivating and measurable, yet not so specific that they have unintended consequences. Yeah, that's that's the million dollar one right there. That's So Steve, that is the issue. That's why I always give my people the 5-2 assignment. Now, you got to be careful about it because you might get your one. The first time I was ever asked, I was at a workshop. It was called Managing Multiple Priorities. And one of the in one of the breakout sessions, we were asked to talk about, and this is 1990, um, and I was dealing with uh, uh, a principal I had no respect for. Oh, I said that out loud. And uh, a newborn. Uh, her name's Kelly, and now she's 31. Um, and I was kind of lost. And I said, you know, in 20 years, because it was plenty of time, I want to be retired. Well, lo and behold, in 2010, I retired to do what I, you know. Basically, I, I retired to do what I want. And basically, for the last decade plus, you know, I, I do what I want. And it's kind of a nice way to live. Um, that was a fairly specific goal, but vague enough. I didn't say how I was going to do it. I just said, this is what I want to do. Let's go to the second part of your question, because there's there's something there that's going to help us all. I want to dance at my granddaughter's wedding is an example you often use in your own life. And it's a lovely sentiment. That said, if she decides to pursue a career rather than family, her choice makes your decision along goal unattainable. Additionally, what unintended pressures might your goal impose on your granddaughter as she grows? I don't know. I don't think she knows that. And I don't, I know a lot, I say it a lot. Well, I already built in the, I already have the asterisks built in, Steve, on that. The idea is that I want to be around. <laughs> I want to be around. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to be around. And so... You know, I made some decisions this year to get my body weight down. So I made some decisions financially to, you know, set aside more money. I made, you know, so decision, decision, decision. Um, perhaps it is better to untangle our goals from the goals of others. But Steve, that would, I agree 100% with you. I agree. Having said that, that's not the way I live. I, I am a communal monster. I, I live in community. Um. We did this thing at the USOC, uh, Olympic Training Center, where uh, um, we were asked to, to do our, our highs and lows of our career and then pick one of our highs. And then it was called the circle exercise. And then you, 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 you just start thinking about every single memory you had. Well, every single memory I had of that day was people. My mom and dad were there. My sister showed up with my three nieces. Father Dan Derry came by that day. I saw my brother Gary after I threw this massive toss. Um, Paul told me to move my, you know, move my starting point to the left just a little bit. Uh, Coach Mon was there, and he was so excited for me. If, well, let's just say with Coach Mon, as excited as Coach Mon got. Okay. So for me, I, I always have to tie it in with other people. Your mileage may vary, and that's something you'll have to unpack yourself. I have a goals course at DanJohnUniversity.com. Um, that might be worth your time to hear all my other thoughts besides just that one. Okay. Thanks. Good, good question. Joanna has a question. First off, thank you for the advice you give me, you gave me about preparing for shoulder surgery back in episode 61. That was a while ago, but uh, you're welcome. Since you said to get back to you, I'm happy to report that it was a smooth and successful experience. Good. 
we ended up cleaning up some fraying of the rotator cuff and during, doing an anterior labrum repair. Well, that's good. I have no idea what that all means. But being that it was my first surgery, I learned a lot. Probably my biggest takeaway was to celebrate any and all wins along the way. Absolutely. Ab truth. Truth bomb. Truth bomb. Truth bomb. Good job. Yeah. Vi small victories, man, after a surgery. Um, I'll be real, since you always mention it too, the first win is probably that first post oop ahem number two, shall I say. That's pooping. Uh, yep, take the fiber, people. I also enjoyed getting better at using my left hand for everything. I still remember the first time I could comfortably lift up my arm to work the radio in the car. And probably my favorite win was that first chin-up after four and a half months. Well, good for you. That's very good. Walking out that last follow-up with the surgeon last month was so satisfying to look back and say, I did that. Julia, nice work. In case any of your gentle listeners are looking ahead to a, sh a shoulder surgery, I will pass along the worst pain for me was three days post-op when I could finally take a shower. Extending my elbow after three days in a sling is unique and awful pain. I can still remember to this day. Oh, there's always something like that, huh? After that, it didn't seem too bad. Take your meds, do the physical therapy, do the PT, go on lots of walks, and maybe practice ahead of time with your left hand. That's good. Yeah. And, and it worked all well for me. And now with this update comes another question from me. Sorry to transition it like this, but here you go. I am frustrated. Backstory. I spent seven years teaching and coaching in high school that is in dire need of a lifting culture overhaul. You've probably seen it before. While we're great at telling our students to get in the weight room, the instruction from our PE teachers. So once again, two PE questions, one podcast. Folks, I think there's an issue here. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. And most of our coaching is very poor. Yep. To put it simply, they don't know what they don't know. So in their minds, just being in the weight room equals good, despite ongoingly poor technique and no supervision on training, on the form, the function, and the focus of the why of lifting. Over the years, I've done everything I could to uh, coach effectively lifting with my chill athletes on the volleyball and track teams but it's always been an uphill battle as they just go on to other sports and regress after poor or no coaching. Other coaches didn't seem to take it seriously when I'd advise we need to do better to at least make it safer. Just blank stares, the sound of crickets, and then nothing changed. They should all be fired. Your principal, if you've complained, should be fired. And anybody upstream who you've informed should be fired. The most dangerous place in a high school is the weight room. There's an exercise that kills called the bench press. People can get hurt badly, lose fingers in the weight room. And I'm not just making this up. I mean, would you let the chemistry teacher not let the students use goggles? I mean. Coaches didn't seem to take it seriously when I invite, okay. Um, eventually I pursued coaching certifications and weightlifting performance, knowing they'd help me as a, be a better coach but admittedly hoping they'd gain me more credibility with coworkers. Didn't seem to make any difference why would it with my credibility, although I'm still glad I put in the time. Absolutely. I'm hung up, I hung up teaching at the end of the last school year and moved on as a health coach, but I'm still fortunate to be near the campus in their weight room. Most of our coaches are overworked teachers and could use the help, so I've offered to many of them to work with their teams to essentially be their lifting coach. Since now I have more time and would do it for free, I might add. But so far, I've got little interest or traction. Yeah, well, because school life 101 is your, your keychain. And the more keys you have, the more power you have. Uh, high schools especially are the strangest places I've ever interacted. Um, the, the, as much as I love both the schools I taught at, you know, the inmates run the asylum. And I was one of the, I was one of the crazies. Again, uh, the coaches and athletic director don't know what they don't know. So to them, the box is checked. The kids are in there and the coach need to encourage them to throw more weight on the bar. Well, speculation is risky, I know, but I can't help wondering if some ego is in play. And finally, you got to the point, Joanna. Ego. That's no, ego, yeah. Um, and that's why, uh, as many of my listeners know, at least once a year, I go to somebody else's workshop and I 
bury my nose and I act like I don't know anything and learn anything. I told you at the Air Day Throws Nation one, uh, Eric walked up to me and said, the second day he goes, you're, you're the Dan John. And I thought, well, that's kind of funny. I'm like the Ohio State University or the Utah State University. That's kind of interesting. Um, it's hard for me to drop my ego. <laughs> I got a massive one. I think I can do anything. I think I'm unstoppable. I think, and I say many times, uh, surgeries are God, God's way of telling me to slow down. Yeah, so it's egos, and you're right. <sighs> and then this great little quote here. Most of the coaches are older than me. Almost all of them are men, and they've been there much longer than me. Ooh, that's a tough one. Can a 33-year-old woman really know more than them? Yes. But the fact is they have zero expertise in weightlifting. Many of them don't even do it themselves. And they probably don't fully understand the injury risk at play. I wrestle daily with the question of when it's time to shake the dust off my feet and leave them in their ways. Well, I mean, honestly, I, I would suggest leaving because uh, it doesn't seem like this school is going to change. Um, and uh, Joanna, if you think slapping your head against the wall is a good idea, after a while, even the wall thinks it's a bad idea. That's not the most positive advice I've ever given. But then it feels like I'm abandoning the kids when they're in so much need of help. Yeah, it's, when I finally left teaching, I, I felt that way. I just felt pushed out oddly. Yeah. Truthfully, I don't even know what the right question to ask of you. I just know I could use some advice. How can you help when help isn't wanted but is undeniably needed? Um, we could talk about climate change, same thing. We could talk about anti-vaccine, same thing. Um, I, I put an article in the newsletter about, about a week ago about how the more you argue with somebody about like whether or not... Uh, I believe John F. Kennedy was killed by one person, okay? That's what I believe. If I, if I go to somebody who's a JFK conspiracy theorist, facts won't change anything with them. In fact, they'll get more entrenched. Um, and I do think we landed on the moon, and I think the Earth is round. I just lost followers right there. I always appreciate hearing your thoughts as you are someone I very much respect. So thanks in advance for any you have to give. Joanna, I've been trying to give advice throughout this whole thing. I just wanted you to hear that I agree with you. I understand your conflicts. I have walked through your conflicts. And you'll notice I don't teach at the schools anymore. I quit. I gave up. Oh, I'm finally a postscript. It was really hard trying to condense all this into an email, but hopefully I gave you a fairly clear picture. Truth be told, I spend hours every week walking and talking this through my, with my husband, who still works at the school, and he's feeling all the same frustrations and fighting the same battle. We could both use some sage advice here. You know, the New England Patriots only have one sign up on a wall, and it's do your job, you know. And what I've discovered when I'm in situations, I've learned some tough lessons. You know, I've, I've thought things were stupid twice in my career and didn't raise my hand and say it. And both times I ended up in charge of those stupid ideas, in charge of that idiotic 2000 program called, what is it? I can't even remember what we called it, Renewal. Yeah, it was Renewal. Oh, God, it was terrible. The curse of Cassandra, you know, Cassandra was a muse who always told the truth, but her curse was nobody ever listened to her. So, Cassandra, Joanna, you know, it's just, you're always, just tell the truth, stay with the truth, help where you can help, and and just keep trying for the, for the small victories. And on this day, that's the best I can do. So there you go, folks. Another episode in the bin. Episode 110 is behind us. Remember, if you have questions, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. If you have a moment, check out our new Easy Strength course. I am sure you're going to love it. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning.